Hello and welcome to Wake Up with Dr. Cheryl. I'm Dr. Cheryl and we have a very special honored guest, John Roosevelt Bottiger. He is joining us from Mill Valley and he is going to talk about his own history and his well, anyway, we'll take it for there, from there. And, but thank you for being here, John. Very happy to be here. And um, I know it's been a long time coming that, to get you here, actually. Um, one of my uh, elder lady friends was trying to get you to come on here, but it didn't. Mm. Timing wasn't right. Mm. But Hunter, God bless him. Yes. <laughs> Hunter's yes. the CEO of the Redwoods. And, right. Um, anyway, so tell us a little bit of history about where you came from originally before we go sure um you know were you born in seattle seattle yeah, wow yeah yeah we lived on a an island in the middle of lake washington yeah, mercer island yeah. yeah i grew up in bellevue you did yes i did right across the way yes our best friend my parents best friends were in bellevue and and uh, my father had a little boat called the News Hawk. The News Hawk. <laughs> and uh, he was the publisher of uh, the Seattle Post Intelligence. Oh, okay. And my mother, they, they went out as a pair. I can tell you about their getting together, but my mother, Anna Roosevelt, married my father, John Bodiger, uh -huh. um, in 1935. They, they met though, through what I was about to describe, um, he had written this story, actually a series of about a half dozen stories about the murder of a fellow reporter. Mm -hmm. and, and Colonel McCormick, who was at that point the czar of the Chicago Tribune, um, said, John, th th that series was so successful that I want to offer you any job at the Tribune that you oh. want. And my father, who'd never been out of the Middle West, never, never had a political bone in his body at that point, said, well, you know, I'm really intrigued by the possibility of following the campaign of this interesting governor of the state of New York who's running for president. Yeah. And McCormick said, well, that's what you want to do, do it. Mm -hmm. So my parents met on the campaign train oh, in funny. 1932. Okay, all right. Well, I guess that was apropos to your, your mother's history because your grandparents were Eleanor and Franklin. Yes. So um, you were how old, about eight or so when you were living in the White House? In the White House. We, le we left when my father went to war, so I was in the White House from, well, essentially during most of, most of the war, from early 42 mm. mm. to the end of the war and, and, and uh, well, w with my grandfather's death in April of 45 oh. and uh, the Trumans taking over the White House, we we moved back to, to Seattle for to Mercer Island for a year, and uh, so my White House years were the war years, right? World War Two years, and that that's what your grandfather was known for was getting through the Nazis and stopping he, all the Germans. He, yeah, absolutely. The New Deal, I think they called it. Yep. Yeah. He was known for. First of all, getting us through and out of the depression, mm. and then through and victorious in the war. And I think, in general, uh, you know, I, I don't speak just out of personal pride or prejudice. That uh, that uh, I, as a as an amateur historian, would regard FDR as along with maybe Washington and Lincoln mm -hmm. as, as yes. the top oh, three absolutely. American presidents. Absolutely, yeah. yes. For all their accolades and what they've done for the democracy, what they've right. done you know, right. for the world, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, amen to them. <laughs> it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know my grandmother because in, when I was a child, she, she was traveling so often oh. for the Red Cross oh. especially that I, I have barely a memory of her from the White House years. And it wasn't until, uh, until my mother and by that time my stepfather had, uh, had a Fulbright professorship to build a medical school in Shiraz in Iran. Oh, wow. And, and my grandmother said, characteristically for her, Johnny, I know that for these next few years, you're going off to college. I want you to know that when you come home, my home is yours. I yeah. So I lived with her for five years oh. during, during that and time. And you were heading towards being an adult, so you really got yeah, to know her exactly. very well, I'm yes. sure. Yeah. But that was a treasured time, I'm sure. It was. I, th I think of her as, I called her grand mère. She, she, <laughs> she, uh, she knew French before she knew English. And, and uh, she, uh, she also was my first and best mentor. Oh. So her values. Wow. Oh, her values are carrying you know, on forever. Yeah, yeah. Forever. I, yeah. I don't um, remember verbatim on some, but some of the things that she would say, I mean, it's made an impact on millions and millions of yeah. people. Yeah, it's true. She had some a real moral fiber mm. foundation. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Oh my goodness! Yes. So that with growing up with that, I'm I'm sure that's helped you in your career as a psychologist. But let's get. I, I you were sharing how you your first degree or PhD was in political science. Science, right? And uh, right. I. And you, did you? How did you come up with that to study that? Well, what what I'd like to say is what I told you earlier that that you can see how far the the <laughs> apple falls apples from the fall tree. From the tree <laughs> that that I could make it an academic discipline, but I couldn't get very far from politics. And no, no, of course not. There were there were probably two cousins. At, in the family then, who were thought of as potential candidates for public office, and I was one of the two. The, yeah. other, the other was FDR the third, oh, okay. Frank Roosevelt, right. and and uh, and I just uh, was actually Frank as well. Both of us mm. were more intrigued by by a teaching life. Yeah, Frank. Okay spent his whole year teaching at Sarah Lawrence College political economics, so he stayed roughly in the field. Right. I broke with the field in part because I was more interested in families and mm -hmm. children um, and... Uh, psychology then. Psychology. Mm -hmm. And so did my second PhD there. And But I, I, I was able to that to do that second PhD at the same time that I was teaching full time, so it was. What, what were you teaching at that time? I, w I was teaching courses in in what. By then, I'd acquired a second mentor, a psychologist named Eric Erickson. Mm -hmm. Eric Erickson, and his wife Joan. The second after your grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. It is probably as well known as any psychologist, uh, any psychoanalyst in the world. He, he uh, taught at UC Berkeley, um, mm. went east, taught at Harvard, um, and we met um, at the Austin Riggs Center, which was a psychiatric hospital for mostly adolescent in uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and just clicked. And, and he, I, I, he knew I wanted to do the second PhD. He agreed to be 
the chair of the committee, even though he was at Harvard and I was at Amherst. Um, and, uh, and Eric's wife, Joan, who is Canadian, um, was as much a mentor to me as he was. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a pleasure. So what did you do with your, your, um, your PhD in psychology then? Well, I taught primarily first at, at my appointment at Amherst College. Before I went to Amherst, I was doing my graduate work in political science was at Columbia. Oh, okay. And, okay. and I went from my, my intrigue at that point long as I had to stay in political science, was the uses of military force or the, the sought-after use of military force as an instrument of diplomacy. Mm. So the, what, what I, I the, my advisor at Columbia said, uh, you, you've got to finish dissertation here. <laughs> Let me suggest a couple of places you might go, UC Berkeley, or the Rand Corporation, which was is sort of the granddaddy of all think tanks. Mm. And Rand is in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. I went to Rand because I had an office of my own. I wouldn't have to teach. I could focus only on my research. Mm -hmm. And the head of the social science department and I sat down and he said, well, what, what, what do you want to do? What, what, uh, what intrigues you? And I said, I, so I told him the general subject, and he said, well, it's interesting you say that because we have a basement full of the, <laughs> of the raw material of the B-52 pilots who oh are bombing goodness. the Ho Chi Minh Trail oh and North Vietnam, and we don't know what to do with them. How, what would you think about spending several months in our basement? And I said, that doesn't <laughs> sound very attractive, but the idea <laughs> of spending time with, the, with that, those documents oh, sounds sure. wonderful. And yeah. So two books emerged um, from that. That you wrote, that specifically. I wrote yes. from, from that. Um, and, uh, and when I came back then, knowing that I really wanted to teach, I came back to my alma mater to Amherst College, but I was still a political scientist and I was really learning that psychology intrigued me more. And <laughs> so, so. And, I, and I was saying earlier to you, the, the psychology of, of politics? <laughs> well, it wasn't so much the psychology of politics because what, what. I, I'm, it, I'm being it, funny about it, that, it you know. Could, it could have been, it actually could have been, but. But it was, it was, um, it was, it was, the field of clinical psychology, and especially at that point, the first generation of family therapists, most of whom were were psychoanalysts who realized that that whoever is the identified patient, the fact is, it's the family environment that is probably the source of the illness mm -hmm. and and that seemed persuasive to me so so Eric and Joan Erickson um, plus um, some colleagues of theirs from Harvard and and uh, some members of the faculty of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst joined my doctoral committee to develop as a as a psychologist mm -hmm. and and I I practiced I taught I did research um, but teaching was my passion yeah. I love teaching and and uh, as I I've told you before that the the uh, the, the the four existing colleges Amherst Smith College, Mount Holyoke College, the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. decided that they would form a fifth experimenting college and it, they called it Hampshire College and uh, 
and I became Hampshire's first faculty member, and it's still a thriving college. It's one of the few experiments in higher education in those years. Is it pre pre predominantly psychology then? No, no, no it's, oh. it's across the board oh, okay. liberal arts, mm -hmm. but, but uh, there, there are no, de the standard departments don't exist. So I was free to roam. <laughs> and uh, so what I did with my psychology really was to teach, but to teach courses in subjects like dreams, mm -hmm. uh, uh, human development from, from birth to death, mm -hmm. or as Eric's Harvard students would call it, from womb to tomb, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I enjoyed 25 years of teaching yes. at Hampshire and probably would not have left were it not for my former wife who, who said, who was the father of two of my children, mm. who said, uh, I, I'm, I have to move for my own professional reasons out to California. So I, I uh, moved to California without a job and uh, uh, finally met met someone living. I was living in in uh, the town of Bodega, where mm. Alfred Hitchcock oh, filmed, yes, the, filmed birds. Uh, the birds. <laughs> and and uh, a, a woman that I that I came to know there said, "John, you're about the the least inclined to market yourself." as anyone I've ever met, <laughs> and which was, I'm sure, true. And she said, if you allow me, I know lots of people in your field in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So she put me in touch with, with uh, a fellow named John O'Neill, who's the president of a four-campus uh, graduate program in... Um, clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the Berkeley campus of that, of the, what was called the California School of Professional Psychology. Mm -hmm. Taught there happily for five or six years. And, uh, you know, so. So getting back to your books, um, you had mentioned, I guess, because of the, the, um, high caliber information that was in those books that they were never really published? They out. were never published, no. Okay. It was, yeah. I, uh, having a top secret clearance wasn't adequate for me to go into the basement of the Rand Corporation. I had to get something, sounds like James Bond, <laughs> I, I had to get something called Q clearance. Uh. And so, so what I wrote was so classified that the, the catch for me was that nobody on my doctoral committee at Columbia could read the books either. Oh my. So here well, I went out were, there. You were digging through raw material from from pilots and... From pilots. And, oh my gosh. Who flew B-52s during oh, yeah. the war. Oh my. And they would fly me back to the Pentagon. They, they were very generous mm. at Rand, mm -hmm. but... but uh, but it was not a place to stay. So they, those books stayed with Rand? Those books stayed with, uh, my fantasy is that there's one at Rand and there's one in the Pentagon someplace. Oh, oh, but, oh. But it oh. just, it, and by the time I became interested in getting them through the Freedom of Information Act or right, something like right. that, it was, not it was old news. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so yeah. Uh, I did write a book in the, in the mid-70s that was quite different. It was because it was much more my own book. It was a uh, it was a biography of my parents' marriage. Oh, oh, that should be interesting because I know I've read bits and pieces, but it, is it all the truth? You know, it it, <laughs> it was fascinating to write. Uh, I was living by that time, still teaching, but in Amherst, 
but living in Northampton, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and and uh, and it it was easy to, to do. There was so much research about the Roosevelts that I oh, you sure. know, it was just a matter of becoming familiar with it at Hyde Park. But about the Bodigers, no, not so easy. My the Bodiger family w was r really emigrated from the Black Forest part of Germany to uh, to Chicago and then to San Diego. The, the members of the family liked being together, so they all, when they moved, they all moved <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of just a few. Right. So yeah. I went out to San Diego and just hung out with them for weeks and used my mm -hmm. tape recorder. And oh. Great. So the Bodiger side was something I had to put together myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of that book. That so I did you write about both sides of the family? I did. In that book? Yeah. Specifically? Yeah. I called it A Love in Shadow. And uh -huh. it was a the shadow being, well, I think my parents, I know, my parents deeply loved each other. Mm. Uh, but my father also struggled with depression mm. for his whole life. Mm. and. And uh, so part of the shadow in which their love rested was the shadow of his, of his leaning to depression. Mm, yeah. Another piece of the shadow, frankly, was, was the, the, the predominance of the Roosevelt family. The, I didn't grow up among the Bodigers. Right, I mean, they were right. a wonderful group of people right, as right. I got to know them. Right. But well, and, and probably back then they really didn't have a lot of healing sources for, you know, depression. You know, they right. There was almost very little available. Certainly, mm -hmm. no no psychomedications oh, that no. were available. Mm -hmm. And and my father was just not inclined to treat. And anyway, so oh, okay. so yeah, yeah. We we did move to uh, when I was a child to Phoenix, after leaving Seattle, mm -hmm. and and well, uh, Seattle can be very depressing. <laughs> Seattle, with its rain, can be oh, depressing. Oh, and the, and the overcast. Yes. And of course, I was five when we moved there, but you know, when people ask me about Seattle, and I, it's beautiful. Seattle's beautiful, but. After being away for like 25 years right. and going back and living there for one year, yes. I couldn't do it. No. It's like everybody is chasing yeah. the sun yeah. and grumpy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I agree. It, it was, it was uh, our home there I loved and, yeah. and uh, the family w was a wonderful place to be. Um, so I probably had a better um, experience of it than many. Oh sure, but, well Mercer but, Island uh, and Bellevue have always been known to be the the better, you know, yeah, sources of yeah, yeah, you know, resource. Well, I uh, when when they when my father came back from the war, also I think he was deeply shaken. I mean, were it closer to today, I'm sure he would have been diagnosed with PTSD. Oh sure. So the combination of the PTSD and the, and the leaning to depression, which he fought, um, was too much. They mm. they bought up they bought a paper in Phoenix. <laughs> Imagine the idea of Phoenix, Arizona, trying to establish a, a democratic oh liberal newspaper. Oh my goodness! It was oh. the worst conceivable place. <laughs> to establish a, a liberal democratic newspaper, yeah, but they yeah. did it. And it lasted for for a few years. Yeah. They, they couldn't, you know, the, the, the opposition was a paper, I think, called the Arizona Times. <laughs> and it was owned by a fellow named Gene Pulliam, who had very deep pockets and who could, so who could beat the advertising mm, rates mm. of anything my parents could offer. So right, right, yeah. it just didn't work. Oh, good old American uh, greed and addiction right. to power. Right, and right. Money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Oh, my goodness. I better not go there. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, 
big subject in itself. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So, how long have you been retired? Well, you're not really retired. I'm not I mean, thoroughly today retired. When I, when I, I picked know, you I, up, you were saying that you did a, a, a class a, a, today. A class today, yeah. I, and, you, I, and it's about spirituality. It is. It's about Celtic spirituality. And, uh, and it's, it's one of the Redwoods' largest classes, and it, it may be, which means 35 to 40 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, so my interest is in, my interest in religion is as a domain of, of human development, and a critical domain that is neglected by most psychologists. So, so, that was never the case for me. It always intrigued me as part of what it was to grow, not only in childhood, but throughout one's whole life. Well, as a child, did you go to church? As a child, I went to, I went to church with my grandmother. Oh, okay. And, and my... And what, what type of church? What denomination? Episcopal. Episcopal, yeah, okay. Yeah. And so one degree from Catholicism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a, a beautiful little church yeah. called St. James, uh, where my my mother is buried. Um, it's a um, I went first with my grandmother to church because nobody else among the they were, wouldn't go with her. Nobody else would go with oh. her. Okay. And I thought that that just doesn't make sense. Uh -oh. Some somebody yeah. needs to accompany her. So initially the motivation wasn't a religious motivation. It was it was accompanying my grandmother and mm -hmm. and seeing to her well being. But but soon I became intrigued with the meaning of of religion and the church itself and that's always been a part since since those days of of the way that I understand human development. So how how would you integrate spirituality in all of all of this? Oh, I think it, it's essential. The the uh, I mean, spirituality to me is about about growing up. It's about uh, it's about the integration of one's conscious life with as much of one's previously unconscious life oh, as as has been accessible or could be made accessible and and uh, so it was natural for me to to start teaching about spirituality out here um, I I also do some teaching in meditation, and uh, which which was as as natural. Um, what type of meditation do you teach? Well, it's a it's it's. Uh, Are many types? Or yeah. Well, it, no, not it's. I, I think if it had a, a, a uh, if it had a an orientation, when I, when I came to to the redwoods. Um, it it was more of a Buddhist mm -hmm. um, meditation, mm -hmm. um, Zen in particular. Right. Um, I think now it's become partly, but only very partly through my own presence. It's become more eclectic, and and uh, there are as many. Christians and Jews, as there are Buddhists mm -hmm. in the in the uh, in in that in that group, mm -hmm. and uh, it's when I came to the Redwoods, you know, I it, it was as a retirement community, but but I didn't want to stop teaching. No, and you you're not. No, <laughs> and I'm not exactly. So it's, and you can probably teach when whenever you want to. It's, you know, it's when it's, it moves you. It's as easy. I, I mean, at at Hampshire College, it it was very easy for me to teach pretty much whatever I pleased, and and uh, no, no, nobody ever 
assigned me a course, <laughs> you know, which is pretty common in colleges. Yeah, you know, yeah. Bodiger, you, you're going right. to teach the introduction right. to this or that. Yeah. Nobody ever told me that, and and so I could choose well, that's the an courses. Honor. Yeah, you know, I mean, to you. To, I, I could teach the things I wanted to learn about, yeah. which, which yeah. was such a pleasure. Yes, absolutely. So, so how do you integrate spirituality? Well, if you're teaching it, you're practicing it. Yes. And you must practice it every day, whether you're teaching yeah. someone else or... Actually, I, I practice it in some measure through meditation. Um, integrating prayer and meditation mm -hmm. in personal practice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I practice it in, uh, in my teaching. Um, and, uh, and it's a community that, uh, that has lots of fascinating people. I mean, people who've retired <laughs> from Stanford, from UC Berkeley from other UC campuses mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and uh, so plus, there's a uh, there's an opportunity for lots of interesting and learning conversations. Yes, exactly. Right, right. So it's a natural place for me to be, and and I'm grateful that when my kids and I, two of my boys and I, sat around in our living room outside of Boston mm -hmm. to figure out what when my wife died where dad should go mm. we immediately were drawn to the bay area mm, because yeah, i'd lived i'd gone to junior high school at in berkeley and had lived in berkeley a couple of times after mm -hmm. that mm. as well as in the city and knew so knew knew the bay area well yes. and it's hard to leave here it's hard to leave here. It sure is. <laughs> I, I mean, can't I'm imagine from where here. I'd go. Uh, I, I've left um, three times and come back. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. I'm not surprised because <laughs> I, I honestly can't. My, my kids, my daughter, Sarah, lives in uh, Berkeley. Oh, okay. And is an agricultural economist mm -hmm. who works on how to improve the crop yield of farmers, poor farmers in the third world. So she, yeah. she travels a lot. And I hope lot. not using GMO. No, no, no. <laughs> I had to she throw that it, in, she sorry. Does it, <laughs> she does it very responsibly. Sure, and uh, sure. and then my, my three boys, um, one of them is an artist and an interior designer who lives in Petaluma. The second one is um, a rabbi. Oh my! Which was fascinating because I was for many years married to a woman who who had whose history was Jewish, but non-practicing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so at the, right at the time that Joshua, my son, was discovering that he really was drawn to to becoming a rabbi, his mother rediscovered her interest in Judaism. Mm -hmm. So Josh became a rabbi, is now the rabbi of a congregation in Ashland, Oregon. Oh, okay. And then the last son, the eldest, Adam, um, shows how little I knew about the Bodiger side of my family, mm -hmm. that, that when Adam was born, first child born, my wife and I called him Adam, I think, more than any other reason, because we wanted to start afresh. We, we, we didn't want to be burdened by either the Roosevelts oh, or, sure. you know, wh okay. whatever. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so I called the one Bodiger that I knew. It was my father's brother, Bill. And, and I said, excitedly, Uncle Bill, <laughs> guess what? We have given birth <laughs> and we've named him Adam. And I, I, Uncle Bill said, you've named him Adam after your grandfather Adam <laughs> and his father Adam? And you didn't even know. I had no idea. <laughs> isn't that? None. Isn't that? See, that to me is this 
a spiritual synchronicity. Yeah, exactly. That's just what it is. <laughs> oh my yes. goodness. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Wow. So wow. I began to learn about the Bodigers, and they 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 were a romantic mm. and and very loving family for whom I was grateful. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, and then you had your grandmother too, later, you know. Yes, right. That I'm sure right. she adored and appreciated you. Well, and I her. <laughs> she, uh, she was a gift. It, they, they, uh, in 1960, I remember, two years, no, three years before she died, um, we were living together, and and uh, she was still she was. I wouldn't say in love with, but but she admired and was a close friend of Adlai Stevenson, mm -hmm. and she supported Stevenson in '52 and in '56 when he was a Democratic candidate. She even supported him in 1960 when. John Kennedy ended up as the Democratic candidate, and I remember Kennedy coming to our, to our home in Hyde Park, mm -hmm. and in order to persuade her that, that uh, <laughs> he, he, he deserved, <laughs> oh, she she thought funny. she should support him, which she ultimately did. Well, he was charming. Oh yes, yes, yeah. He had a way that moved the whole planet. Absolutely, that's true, yeah. You know, I, I mean, in that, I don't think anybody, you know, I, I give kudos to Obama. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we, anyway, I, I don't want to go in that direction. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Except that for the positive, for the positive. Yes. But, um, you know, it, it's, in fact, my ancestor, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, ran against John Adams. Really? Yes, oh. and, and he lost by just a few votes. Oh, really? So we could have had a President Pinckney? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's in the, the uh, archive. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I just remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, I worked for the State Department for... for for uh, only for about a year, but was it, that after it, it, Rand? It was after Rand, yeah. and and uh, um, it, it was it was interesting work. But by that time, I was already on my road toward being a psychologist, and and uh, um, so yeah, it wasn't wasn't where I wanted mm -hmm, to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, mm. my goodness. Um, what else would you like to share? <laughs> I'm sure you have a plethora of, of sharing, but... Um, well, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I use this show as, or at least I hope to, you know, educate mm. and inspire mm. the viewers. Mm. and. Uh, especially inspire because of what's going on in our global community. Yes. Um, you know, the moral um, attitude is, has changed. And um, I always like to get inspirational whenever possible because yes. we need it. And so I, if you have any other wonderful inspiration that you would like to share, I would love to, <laughs> we would love to hear it. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what that would be. I, I, well, the fact the that you're teaching the, meditation. The source of inspiration for me has always been the relationship with the kids that I was teaching. Yeah. And now, not kids, but right. people in their 70s, 80s, 90s. And, and uh, it's a whole new, new experience to teach in, in a community, in a retirement mm -hmm, community, mm -hmm. but I love it because mm -hmm. the people are so interesting. That they, their histories are full of of uh, personal lives that have been meaningful, and 
and uh, and yet the 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 classes, the seminars, the whatever we call them, groups is really our generic mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. I think are are uh, are f like the one I mentioned to you in Celtic spirituality is, is Ex something Explain that, what the difference is in that. I, I'm curious because I, I don't know the difference between, you know, I mean, I've studied spirituality for years mm. on, from different gurus or, or, you know, mentors, but Celtic, I don't really know too much about that. The Celts were, were uh, people primarily Irish, Welsh, Scottish, mm -hmm. who who uh, who practiced a form of Christianity that that was um, deeply connected with the natural world. That that the the sense of 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 how important it was if one's to be as thoroughly spiritual as one can be, to to take account of one's responsibilities and one's opportunities in the natural world. It was central to the Celtic tradition, and um, there's a oh maybe four or five months ago, three of us at the Redwoods had a chance to go to. Uh, Santa Sabina, the Catholic retreat in here in San Rafael in oh. the hills, um, to a that was led by a man named John Newell, N E W E L L, who who uh, is now the principal. He's Scottish. He's a minister in the Church of Scotland, and he's the he's the, he he knows more <laughs> about. The, the Celts in in their own communities in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, but also as they moved through elsewhere in Europe. So it's a it's a tradition, largely Christian in character, though not exclusively. That uh, so what's it, if it's not exclusively? What's the, the well? Uh, I mean, there there are there for example in in my my course in, in uh, Celtic spirituality, mm -hmm. there are as many Jews and, yeah, yeah. Buddhists as, and, and, and Buddhists, for yeah, that matter, right. as, as there are Christians. And yeah, well, that's what we're here for anyway, is to you know, have all that diversity and we're still under one source, right. one God anyway. Exactly. So, yes. I mean, that's one thing I totally loved about the religious science of mind was <clears throat> mm. studying all the nine prophets mm. and they all have positive things yes. and understanding it and bringing it all together instead of separating right you know yes. you shouldn't be separating yes <sighs> no, you're idealist right. but hey <laughs> makes good sense though it really does uh. So if there's one thing about Celtic spirituality that you can share that might inspire, what would you say? Well, it would be, I think it would be twofold. One is, is that is the importance that the, that the Celtic tradition endowed the natural world uh, as critical to one. Now when you say the natural world, are you, are you, I know that's probably a huge uh, <laughs> answer, but staying natural with food, staying, you know, with the heart, staying, and not all the plastic, um, you know, facade out there, but. No, it was, the, or, I think the Celts really meant, meant primarily be aware of the fact that you live on this earth, that and on whatever, whatever piece of it mm -hmm. that your family or your community mm -hmm. live in, mm -hmm. that 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 relationship between between that earth, whether it's marsh or water or mm -hmm. or field and farmland mm -hmm. or forest, 
your relationship with that world is critical. Mm -hmm. sure. And and that's so that's that's okay, part that's of right. of the the other the other piece of it really is is uh, the the intimacy of the relationship between um, one's conscious life <laughs> and and what maybe started out as unconscious oh boy but but it's it's so important to, in the celtic tradition to draw out of that buried shadow mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. of the unconscious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. draw it into consciousness and make it part because it it just enriches one's life absolutely well that's the impetus of my show actually is is um the unconscious relationship with wealth and unconditional love. Yes. That's what the impetus of this show. Really? Yeah. Wow. And it, That's it, terrific. it covers a huge, uh, it, it's very huge really because it covers everything. Mm. But, you know, breaking it down, that's why I have people like you. I mm. have a, somebody with your caliber of intel intelligence and experience mm. and spirituality you know, to share because someone can learn from you. Many people can learn from you, mm. you know, watching this program mm. and um, hopefully learning from me as well. Yes. But in all the other, this is the 171st show that we're doing. Is that doing. right? Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So, <sighs> anyway, oh. they're expecting me to do 200. <laughs> do, you, do you keep an archive? Oh, so, of course. So, yes. Oh, good. yes, of good. course. I'm, I'm very organized that way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yes. Good. Keep, keep it all, definitely. Mm. Mm. But, um, and I noticed that I don't know what the time is because there's not a time clock on the... <laughs> so I've lost track so we, completely. We may, have, we may be way beyond the time. I don't think so. <laughs> no. I think, I think I, they'd be blinking at me if... <laughs> but the clock's not on, so yes. that's okay. It doesn't oh, sure. matter. Why? It doesn't yes. matter. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> because there's plenty to talk about. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh my. Oh. So, how long have you been at the Redwoods? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. And you know, Hunter is a joy. I just have. Hunter is fine. Hunter is very new to us, as you know. Yes. That, that, I know, but. And, we, I think we were lucky to get him. He's, oh, it's, it's, his passion, it, you know, for being there yes. is is so acute. Yes. I love it. Yes. You know, and that's, yeah. you know, of any organization, mm -hmm. the the leader, yes. in, you know, makes, makes a all great the big difference. difference. Yeah, yes. You know, so. He and his, he is CEO and, and the, um, there's a woman named Susan Badger who is our COO and she has been, Susan's been at the Redwoods for many years, but the two of them are terrific partners. Oh, great. And yeah. so we've, yeah. got, we've got a leadership a team. A team that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. and that also helps you to be doing what you want to keep doing. Exactly. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that all the, uh, the residents appreciate it too, you know, well, to keep it keep it going. Now, do you have people that come from outside that also can join your classes? Yes, yes. I I've mentioned to to uh, to lots of people who are outside that they're welcome to come. Like some um, of your colleagues that you yeah, taught with, yeah. you know, that maybe at Berkeley or people that people yeah. that I've taught with, uh, or just people that I meet in the course of. Uh, a meditation program elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, okay. or I I, uh, I go to church in t in, in Tiburon, mm -hmm. and so I may run into somebody yeah. as I did last Sunday, uh, who who uh, seemed intrigued by the the way I would describe what I did at the Redwoods, and I said, "Well, come come and see." It's very interesting. Come and see is what yes. is come and see was Jesus's response oh, yeah. to Peter and mm. Peter's brother when they asked him, where are you going? And his answer was, 
come and see. With that, I'm sure that kind of raised eyebrow. You, you, there's no way for me to the tell you where I'm trust, going. The trust, the trust. That's the spiritual trust. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Is letting it all unfold. Yeah, yeah. I wish, I wish that for the whole planet's people, especially the 40 million that are in this area. Mm. Mm. I wish it all for them. Mm. I wish we could just blanket them all and then they yes. could be at peace within themselves and then they can be peace outwardly. Absolutely, yeah. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Well, we do our best. To, That's all we, we can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, if, even if it's one person at a time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hopefully more. Yeah. So, yeah. well, my goodness, this is this has been a joy. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to think if there's any other um, questions that I can come up with. I I had my book and I forgot to put it down here, so everything's do everything I'm doing impromptu here. Mm. <laughs> mm. But um, so. One of the things that I was thinking was, you know, you, you didn't take a political stance because you wanted to get into psychology. Right. And have you ever thought about doing the psychology of politics, or like writing about it, or have, would you even, even attempt? <laughs> well, there, there is a book in the making, but... but uh, oh, but, you're but, making. But I'm, but, uh, yeah, that I'm, that I'm into, but, I'm, but, uh, but I've sort of sworn myself to secrecy about its theme until, oh, until oh, oh, I yeah, really right. know what, it, what it's going to be. But, but, uh, I mean, I, I would think that would be a, a, a bestseller, especially what's going on in our society today, mm, in, mm. in the community of, of uh, the pol political community. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, unbelievable, I think that would be. Very interesting. Well, I hope so. We'll see. Oh, so you are working on something in that yes. direction. Yes, yes. Oh, well, I would no, love I, to read it. Writing has been my craft Yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah. most of my life, and my writing and teaching. And, right, and, right. And uh, I love to write, so so it's, it's natural to uh And to when you wrote continue. your first books, you didn't have a computer, did you? You were typing. I was typing. I was actually, <laughs> you know, I was actually writing longhand oh, yeah, when the I beginning. when I was, not not at not at uh, not not at Rand oh, okay. when I was doing the Vietnam books. Mm. Um, I actually had a typist, um, so I was dictating. Did you dictate? Dictating, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but when I was writing a Love in Shadow, I was I was writing in longhand up and this wonderful house built by a Civil War general in, in Northampton, Massachusetts. And, and I'd write for a morning, and I'd bring it down to my wife, and, and I would read it to her, or she would read, mm -hmm. and we'd talk about it over mm -hmm. lunch. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go back upstairs to my little eerie at the, in the attic and, <laughs> and, uh, and write for the rest of the day. It only took what a month and a half to to write the book that that I treasure among oh, wow. all of them. That's a sh well, when you work on it every day and you have that yeah. time, it's easy. Yeah. yeah, I know. Wow. Okay, because I think it took me about seven months to write my first book, mm. but I didn't have all the time. You know, I'd work on it every day, but I didn't. I didn't have the you luxury didn't. of. The, yes. I was still working and right. so forth. Uh, right. You know. Yes. But that's commendable. Mm. Mm. So I'm. I'm. I'm very interested to hear this next book. <laughs> okay. Well, you'll be one of the early ones oh, I tell about it. Oh yes. yeah, because yes. to me that that is. Um, I think the public should know. <laughs> <laughs> And not yeah. just be gullible and believe what they hear. <laughs> right, right, right. No. You know. Well, well, well. Well, I know that there's some pictures, and if it's okay, we'll take some pictures um, off of your site um, of you and your... When you say my site. Well, uh, Facebook. I, I don't have any... I'm, I'm not a member of Facebook. 
I, I, I was for a time. Oh, okay. So you're but, off but of it. I have a, I have what what I like to think of as an online journal. Oh. But, but it's otherwise known as a blog. Oh, okay. Okay. It's called Reckonings. Reckonings. Uh, uh, do reco you have Reckonings. Okay. A, a journal of justice, hope, and history. Oh, well, that's good. And and I so I feed. It's 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 just a pleasure to I I. It, a reasonable number of readers, yes, most of whom I don't know, but they there's an opportunity to respond, mm -hmm. and then I can re respond to sure. them. So it's a good way to, to yeah. you know Start to be in the, touch. Yeah, and do you have photos of your historical background with the Roosevelts? Mm, some, some, okay, some. yeah, yeah, because yeah. it would be living. fun to integrate a few pictures in in this show. Oh, I'd be happy to see what I have. Okay. The one part of my life that I haven't spoken of, except as we were coming here, um, was the years I spent in Norway. Oh yes. And they, they, they were seven of the richest years, of, because both my wife and I, psychologists, mm -hmm. she from Harvard in the medical school, me from from Amherst and Hampshire. Um, it was a natural, and we kept coming. We we do consulting in different parts of the world, and and uh, we but we kept coming back to this community in Norway, in sort of southwestern Norway, and called Modumbad, which in Norwegian essentially means the baths at Modum. The baths. The baths. The, B a t h s. Oh, 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 okay, okay. The baths, because yeah, 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 sure. in the 19th century it was a Spa. Oh, okay. And then, like the Bodens in in Germany. Yes, yeah, right, right, right. So, it in in 1957, it was bought by two psychiatrists, who turned it into a healing community. Mm. And so there is a hospital that's that's at the center, physically at the center, but but uh, in which, other than we the we didn't take patients who were violent because we mm -hmm. wanted open wards. But other than that, pretty much the range mm -hmm. of, of people who would profit from several months in a psychiatric right. hospital. Right. Yeah. And then, but there also were, it was like a campus with, with pods of, of uh, little villages uh, that were not so much designed for psychiatric treatment as they were a place for for people with active careers yeah. doctors nurses pastors uh, lawyers to come and rest mm -hmm. to come for for a few days of collegial uh, relaxation mm -hmm. and uh, and I I worked with them as well as the patients in the hospital, and, and it was, as I think, were it not for the fact that 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 uh, that my wife developed ALS, that uh, that we would we might still be there. The, the one mm -hmm. big downside was that all of our children were were here in the states, mm -hmm. and they'd come over for short periods right. of time, but right. I wasn't really living near them as I am now. Yeah, right, right, so. yeah. Well, amen to that. <laughs> and thank you so much. Our time is up. Oh, okay. Our time is up. This, thank you. For this session, anyway. Yeah. Thank you very it much. It was a pleasure. And, um, you know, thank you, Marin TV. And um, yes. if you like our show, please let us know on hashtag... Mm our NTV or our Facebook page. Until the next time, thank you.